Okay. So um, I was going to talk about some of the uh, research I've been doing uh, as part of my PhD that I kind of touched on briefly uh, last week, um, and some of it which is going into uh, a paper I'm um, aiming to submit to iClear. Um, but kind of the main reason I'm talking about this is it's kind of a uh, possible relation to uh, some of the work at Numenta and whether this could uh, kind of complement some of the ideas at Numenta and, and form the kind of basis of uh, the actual project I do for the internship. Um, and so this, uh, yeah, I'll kind of talk uh, at kind of very high level about some of the kind of core ideas um, and kind of motivation and then more kind of concretely how this could be um, kind of implemented in convolutional neural networks so that these kind of representations that I'm going to talk about can actually be used. Um, and that's kind of the, the half an hour presentation and then the relevance to adversarial examples, uh, which is where the kind of stuff that goes into the iClear paper uh, really comes in, um, is, is the kind of further stuff. And maybe I can do that next week or something if we don't have time today. Um, and so the kind of motivation of all this work is uh, this kind of classical uh, problem from neuroscience and psychology known as the binding problem. And, by the way, apologies to for kind of any of this uh, that I discussed that's uh, kind of familiar territory to uh, people here. Um, but so the, the kind of binding problem is really this question of if uh, features such as, you know, a, let's say a triangle uh, shape and uh, the color blue are encoded in different neurons or sub subpopulations of neurons uh, in the brain, uh, then how uh, do we develop this kind of uh, unified representation of, say, a blue triangle localized in space uh, rather than kind of, you know, disembodied free-floating features. Um, and this can also be thought of in a hierarchical sense. So, you know, how do we uh, understand that it's a particular vertical and horizontal bar, again, located in space uh, that are forming the representation of a T? Um, and, uh, and, and how do we have access to that information? And uh, this particularly comes up when one's kind of uh, looking, for example, at multiple uh, stimuli simultaneously. So, you know, for example, how do we understand that it's a particular vertical and horizontal bar here uh, that compose the T, uh, but then the same prim primitive features in different locations are composing uh, an L over here. Um, and there's kind of a rich history of, uh, you know, different uh, proposed solutions to this problem, uh, which I, I won't go into. Um, but, um, but kind of for today, I'm, I'm gonna focus on this kind of particular hierarchical question. Um, and I kind of, I showed this slide uh, the other uh, last week um, with kind of showing this idea that in the kind of typical hierarchical uh, representation of visual processing, you get this kind of increasing abstraction and increasing invariance of kind of tolerance to, to changes in the input uh, from this very high dimensional uh, detailed um, image when it you know, hits the retina or, or the pixels are fed into a CNN or whatever it may be. Um, and this kind of representation at the top is, is very good for things like um, object classification. Um, but of course, this loses a lot of information as well. Um, and so the kind of question is, how, can, uh, how is it possible then to kind of jointly represent these abstract representations with the uh, simpler low level features uh, that are composing um, this kind of more abstract uh, object uh, and in particular kind of make this information accessible to uh, higher levels of uh, processing. Um, and so convolutional neural networks are an example of a, a system that uh, have kind of solved the, the sort of the backbone of this problem very well in terms of or, or at least they have a solution to this problem of kind of achieving invariance and uh, abstraction uh, and indeed perform impressively on things like object recognition and possibly even have some uh, kind of correlates to uh, what's going on in our own brain in terms of predicting neural activity uh, and so forth. But, um, but clearly what, what's going on here is, is you know, not the full story uh, and you know, the representation at the, the highest levels of these uh, systems uh, are generally uh, quite impoverished when you compare to uh, our own. So you know, there's no understanding that this kind of tag is in, in the animal's left ear or that you know, it's missing a horn uh, or whatever the kind of particular uh, details may be. Um, and I know that in this uh, group, there's been kind of discussions of capsule networks um, and their kind of uh, significance in vision. So I thought it would be uh, useful to just kind of uh, 
be uh, specific about the kind of distinction between what I'm describing and what, uh, at least in my view, capsule networks are, are kind of aiming to solve. Um, so if you kind of imagine again this toy example of T with vertical and horizontal bars, um, there's actually kind of multiple aspects to uh, binding, uh, which I thought Ann Treisman uh, kind of, who was a, a major figure in, in kind of the literature on binding, uh, laid out very nicely in this in paper. And she described it as uh, encoding, structural description, and parsing. And so parsing is kind of just selecting what low level features are going to compose this object. And together with structural description, uh, how do the kind of spatial relations between these features essentially tell us that it's a T rather than an L. And so uh, this is something that convolutional neural networks have a solution for, uh, but it's not necessarily a particularly robust one. And they end up doing uh, something along the lines of kind of a, a bag of feature detection uh, kind of template search. And um, whereas capsule networks have kind of been motivated by this idea of trying to respect the the spatial relations between these low-level features um, in when, when doing this kind of parsing and structural description, uh, and also then kind of passing on some information uh, in this higher-level activity so that the same thing can then happen at the next layer of processing. So that you can imagine, okay, then whatever that T you're maybe uh, forming a part of, because capsules also capture some coarse spatial information, which they describe as pose, uh, then that can inform parsing and structural description at the next layer of processing. Um, encoding is about uh, capturing what features uh, are actually part of uh, this object in, in kind of an object-centered uh, frame of reference. Um, and so, and this is what I'm uh, kind of talking about today. Um, and in particular, kind of capturing this idea that uh, this vertical bar is causally uh, part of this uh, high-level kind of abstract neuron. Um, and so just kind of to, to give some kind of images to maybe help with the kind of intuition of that. So with capsule networks, the idea is kind of, if you have say a face detector, you want it to kind of uh, look for faces where the kind of spatial relations between the eyes, the, the mouth, the nose and so forth is um, consistent with the presence of a face. Uh, and also encode some information, say kind of what direction is the face looking uh, and, and maybe some other kind of um, uh, kind of uh, a, a few other kind of uh, course features. With uh, the kind of hierarchical binding that I'm describing, it's more capturing, for example, the idea that, you know, you see this cat, and, and so you may have detected it's a cat through a mechanism like capsules, but then you are encoding that, you know, this left ear is absent or the, the uh, right eye is scarred and, and kind of milky and uh, lots of uh, different uh, features in the relation to this representation of this particular feline uh, that you couldn't capture in just uh, with a single kind of capsule. Um, and so uh, there are different ways uh, that this, you know, the brain could potentially solve this. Uh, I'm not going to claim that this is the kind of only way, but um, all of this kind of originated from a theory uh, developed um, by my supervisor, Simon Stringer, uh, two years ago. Um, and so um, I thought it could just be kind of interesting to talk about um, how kind of he proposed it might be implemented. Um, and then uh, that might kind of reinforce some of the ideas. Um, but the, the kind of work I've been doing is, has been trying to abstract away some of these uh, details. Um, but I still thought that could be interesting to cover. And so- um, hey, hey, Niels. Um, yeah. So you've also, um, you know, I, I know you've also looked through our displacement vector stuff and the frameworks mm. paper and stuff. So it would be interesting at some point uh, if you can relate uh, definitely. Some of these and, yeah. definitely, and, uh, and we that's can leave what that for gonna, later. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm going to try and cover um, kind of towards the end. After I've um, so I, I was going to touch on kind of how exactly I've implemented this in uh, deep neural networks because I think kind of seeing explicitly what the representations look like in the network will will make everything a bit more concrete. And in particular, the kind of how this this relates to yeah grid cell uh, cortical grid cells and, and displacement cells. But yeah, so um, the kind of the original proposal for how this might be implemented builds on this idea of polychrony, which um, is you can think of kind of as similar to synchrony, um, where you have kind of spatial temporal patterns, uh, but that these are asynchronous, but time locked. So just to kind of unpack that a bit, 
if you have these kind of presynaptic neurons B, C, and D that are driving activity in A and E, uh, kind of often there's been, or at least traditionally many years ago, there was a lot of interest in kind of uh, neurons that fired synchrony, uh, with, in synchrony. Um, but then uh, the uh, conduction delays uh, that exist in the brain uh, are not uniform. And so it's uh, which often kind of uh, can stymie the sort of emergence and ability to transmit information in synchrony. The idea with polychrony is to actually make use of the fact that one has these kind of non-uniform conduction delays uh, such that the same neurons can fire, uh, the identity is the same, and sorry, so along the x-axis here is time, and along the y-axis the identity of the neurons. Um, but depending on the particular uh, pattern with which they fire, the uh, uh, signals will arrive at, uh, for example, different postsynaptic cells and therefore encode uh, different things. Um, that's the, the kind of the, the basic idea and uh, this uh, kind of has some uh, nice computational uh, properties including uh, often these representations are, are sparse and you know you can encode a, a huge amount of information in these so uh, similar to um, SDRs um, and then they kind of added the ideas that so these neurons are, or the kind of complementary ideas that these neurons are um, spiking neurons that are encode that are uh, represented with uh, membrane voltages that uh, vary kind of continuously over time. Um, and so they are sensitive to this coincidence detection. So, oh, so and that's this idea of this ob detection. Ob obviously this is a powerful way of encoding information, but is how much was this based on sort of biological evidence that this could actually be happening? Yeah, so um, no, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, when, when this paper came out, it was kind of very fashionable, this idea of uh, kind of neurons encoding information in you know, synfire chains, synfire braids, that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, there was this paper, Cortical Songs, uh, which you know, turned out they'd, uh, which kind of claimed some experimental evidence of this, but then uh, they'd kind of done some statistically not kind of great practice. Uh, and so, uh, for a while, there, there hasn't been as much interest in this. Um, I think part of that is uh, just the limitations of the recording technology. In general, if you were to assume that this is actually how the, the kind of brain uh, encodes information, you would need to record from uh, an enormous number of cells in parallel. Yeah. Um, but even if you have those recordings, so even detecting these kind of patterns in silico is challenging. And it's only over the last couple of years that uh, kind of robust statistical methods have been developed to both uh, kind of align the spike times as well as um, actually detect these kind of uh, yeah. patterns from, from the statistics of the activity. I mean, it's a very um, challenging thing to assume neurons could do this. Um, it, yeah, it, it reminds me of a bit of, you know, there's, there's a group of people who argue that the interspike intervals are encoding information. So the, the time between individual spikes in a neuron, it's not a rate coding, it's not a binary coding, but it's a timing between interspikes. And they're compelling, their argument for it is it's really full of information. You can pack a lot of information, right. into art, which is true, but I don't think it's actually happening in the brain just because it, it's an attractive uh, mathematical concept. So this kind of reminds me of that, like, hey, this thing could really pack a lot of information, but right. it doesn't, doesn't seem the kind of things that neurons could actually do in the brain. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I mean, I, I fully accept that it's, um, it's possible that the, the brain can't do this. And so, Kind of the, the, the approach being taken here is um, so, you know, therefore, like the core computation, which I'll kind of touch on a bit more, is this idea of coincidence detection as a means of uh, encoding causal relations uh, between features in the hierarchy. Uh, and so there are different ways that this could be implemented in the brain. So, uh, a kind of a much slower mechanism might be the kind of the firing rate dynamics that neurons uh, take are. are um, kind of continuous as well. And, and so those can kind of summate in, in certain ways. Um, so, so it's possible that, that something else is actually what's implementing this. And that's why uh, for the work I've been doing, I've been kind of trying to abstract that away. But, um, but this is at least okay. one, right. one possible I mean, it's, method. It's worth, it's worth exploring it. But in the end, we have to ask ourselves, is it really going to be possible? Right. I, I remember uh, there was this guy, Lokendra Shastri in, in Berkeley, who was working on this like using synchrony as a way to do bindings and relational information and been working on it since the 80s. And I, 
<laughs> you seem to be always in like one corner uh, working yeah. on the decades in the same thing. I don't know if this is related to his work at all or not. There's a lot of literature on synchrony for binding, um, but that's quite a different, although kind of polychrony and synchrony seem quite similar and obviously do have some similarities, uh, synchrony for binding is a very different idea because that's essentially just saying that, uh, you know, in the T and the L example, um, all of the neurons that are firing for the T are firing synchronously and all the neurons that are firing for the L are firing synchronously. Um, but that quickly runs into several problems in terms of both kind of the number of binding relations that you can actually encode. Um, also in terms of, um, yeah, kind of encoding uh, kind of hierarchical uh, relations. And then also in terms of kind of how you actually read out that information. Whereas, uh, well, hopefully be clear is, is the idea with, Polychrony is, is that you're actually, you have neurons that are explicitly encoding this, these binding relations uh, and therefore can be read out by high, higher layers. Um, so yeah, so I'll, um, mm -hmm. I, can, I can come back to this slide, but, um, but so kind of returning to this, this toy example, um, if uh, say we've got a T and an L, so the T is at location A, B is at location, uh, L is at location B. Uh, and these are being driven amongst other things by these kind of vertical bars. Um, now the, the T and the L are invariant or they have a degree of invariant. So it could be that the T was driven or the, the T could also have been at location B, in which case it would have been driven by uh, this neuron. So it shares uh, connections to, to both. Uh, when these are kind of simultaneously presented both of these vertical uh, bar neurons and both the T and the L neurons will all be active at the same time then. And uh, so the, the T neuron, although it's being driven by this neuron's activity, is also receiving um, spikes from, from this neuron. And there's no way to kind of capture and code that it's uh, necessarily this neuron. You can imagine perhaps, and, and I'll get into kind of some of the limitations of this, but just for the sake of argument, that you add uh, a third neuron, a kind of binding, hierarchical binding neuron that says, okay, it was the, this uh, neuron that drove that one. Um, and then you would have another one if it was this neuron that drove the T. But, uh, and, you know, the desire then is in this case, when you present uh, both the T and the L, it's the binding neuron that's encoding the relation between these two that's active and not the other one. But because all four of these neurons are coactive, uh, if you just have kind of a rate coded system, then any kind of binding neurons that you include will also uh, be active. Um, so the kind of possible approach to take then is uh, to bring in this idea of polychrony. And in particular, uh, that if you have these uh, conduction delays, then this kind of third neuron that's introduced uh, is, uh, serving as a coincidence detector for this causal relation. And in particular is active if and only if it was actually this vertical bar neuron uh, that drove this one because, um, and hopefully this information will work, uh, because the signals will propagate, this neuron will have driven this one. And so the signals will arrive uh, coincidentally at uh, this neuron. Whereas um, if I go back, even though this neuron is also sending spikes uh, to this neuron, as it hasn't actually causally driven its uh, representation, the binding neurons associated with that vertical uh, neuron will not be active. And um, this kind of relationship, uh, you know, holds if uh, this kind of, uh, yeah, representation is, um, is consistent, but, um, or if these timings are consistent. Which, so you, you still know, need synchrony. Like, you still need synchrony at neuron three. Yes, yeah, so right? it's synchronous arrival. It's synchronous yeah, arrival, yeah. but um, yeah. So so but from the point of delay. view of the postsynaptic neuron, synchrony and polychrony are the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the key difference is just the flexibility of what the presynaptic neurons can can do essentially. Yeah. And so it may seem kind of awfully convenient to have the delays to kind of enable this relationship. But um, interestingly, STPP, if you start with random delays, uh, and sorry, STPP, spike time dependent plasticity is the kind of main form of plasticity uh, that we're aware of in the, in the brain. Um, it, it, it leads to um, exactly these kind of um, uh, timings um, and kind of uh, enabling this, these representations also requires top-down lateral connectivity and then uh, conduction delays. So, all kind of elements from 
uh, neuroscience. Is this, I mean, it's, it's just, it seems like this leads to a sort of a combinatorial explosion problem, the number of three yeah. neurons you need and, and, and because it's not sort of learning this, it's just finding which of the coincidences are occurring. So am I missing something there? No, it's a, it's a, it's a great point. And so the kind of first thing to say is, uh, obviously the way I've been showing this is just kind of a toy diagram for intuition. In reality, each of these features would be encoded in a, in a distributed uh, manner. Um, but more importantly, uh, you know, these, these representations that the binding is actually occurring for, uh, at least in my view, are, you know, they're not going to be some sort of grandmother cell. Uh, it may be you know, that we have um, a limited number of uh, kind of uh, high level objects uh, consistent with kind of you know, uh, the, the human ability to um, represent in parallel you know, between four to seven objects at the same time. So, um, so something like that, in which case the, the order uh, of, as in the, the magnitude of, of binding neurons that you would need is, um, is on the order of the number of neurons, uh, low level neurons that you would, uh, or kind of feature neurons that you would have. And um, I'll kind of, uh, I, I mentioned kind of uh, border ownership cells in a moment as a good example of neurons that uh, seem to have this kind of activity or, or kind of could be consistent with this uh, proposal. And you know, when you look for border ownership cells, the kind of proportion is, is uh, slightly above half um, in areas like B2 and, and B4. Um, so one, qu one question uh, wasn't clear to me. Did the, are the delays learned or are you just assuming there happens to be one that's six milliseconds and another two that are three milliseconds? Yeah, so the, so the delays don't change, they are, initialized randomly and then essentially the delays that um, naturally through SDDP the ones that coincidentally arrive will be strengthened and the others will be pruned um, so you just need to start with a distribution of random delays okay okay um, and then yeah this is just showing you know again just for the sake of intuition just some example kind of PNGs that, that might kind of encode this kind of information and um, yeah like like um, uh, SDR's, you know, activity is uh, sparse and uh, distributed. Um, and then, yeah, as I mentioned, That's kind of... Can I ask you a question? Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, what's controlling uh, the propagation delay in the sense that if you were looking, if it was just, you know, literal propagation delay, then you're limited, the, the cohort is limited to whatever satisfies that triangle equality. So yeah. I'm, I'm trying to understand what, what mechanism allows you to uh, uh, tune the delays. So, um, yeah, so, so there's nothing that actually adjusts the delays. The idea is that you just start with a, a random distribution of, of many delays. And because of the number of uh, synapses that, that neurons share um, and, and the kind of, oh, sorry, the number of neurons uh, in the network, um, they, there's uh, kind of inevitably going to be some, some neuron that will receive coincident activity from uh, these two neurons. Well, that's kind of a self-limiting condition though, isn't it? In that sense, if you're starting off with randoms? Uh, I mean, there, there may be a more principled uh, way of, of doing it uh, for sure, but... Um, I think as long as, you, as long as you don't expect the number of three neurons to detect a lot of things at once, they only have to detect a few, then, and then you're willing to take a, distri a distributed representation of the la three layers, and I guess it would work. It's a little bit like our spatial pooler without, without learning, without training. It works. Um, you can just assume random connectivity, it works, but it works better when you tune it. Um, so maybe that's an analogy. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I don't know much about this. I mean, I, th I think there are biological mechanisms for actually adjusting uh, kind of conduction delays and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, I mean, yeah. So wh whether there's some sort of kind of structural plasticity that that makes this more efficient is, is possible, but certainly in the kind of the original framework um, that, that isn't uh, included. Okay, I was just thinking if there's something semantically interesting going on, but uh, because of the random propagation delays, it falls outside of being coincident, then you would never form a binding. Yeah, if, if, if there was just no, no neuron that received um, the activity, then, uh, then yeah, that would be the case. But I mean, the other thing is, so spiking neurons are kind of interesting because um, 
all kinds of things can happen. I mean, the, the timing um, uh, with, with which this neuron spikes as well. So let's say it does receive this, uh, this activity. The timing with which this neuron spikes uh, kind of varies as a function of the, uh, the strength of the synapses it's receiving, because that affects kind of how rapidly it, it uh, moves above the uh, firing threshold and that sort of thing. So you can actually have kind of shifting in these, in these times as well. And then if you add to that the fact that kind of generally, at least when you simulate these things, um, you have kind of random activity fed into every neuron so that even if a neuron doesn't have uh, kind of good connectivity to, to fire, uh, it will still fire at some point just from the random activity it's receiving. Uh, and this kind of prevents dead neurons, which are otherwise a potential issue with STDP. If kind of a neuron's never been driven, then how is it ever going to um, form connectivity? That's like um, our boosting rule. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, so I mean, ultimately, uh, so I should say, you know, this, this, this is a, a theory, but it hasn't been kind of demonstrated conclusively in with kind of empirical simulations that these uh, kind of binding neurons reliably emerge. Um, so yeah, I mean, as, as you point out, Kevin, it, it may be that you find, okay, well, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe some, sometimes binding relations never get encoded and, and what is the kind of parameter space that one needs in order to ensure that that, that is the case. Okay, well, okay, C continue. I, I, I was just trying to form a model in my head. Mm, yeah, no, no worries. Um, so as mentioned, uh, kind of uh, border ownership cells um, uh, are kind of a, a good example of uh, a neuron that uh, essentially, be, you know, it has a, a small classical receptive field, uh, but let's say in this case, uh, yeah, preferentially activity is higher if uh, it is forming the, let's say, left-hand part of this object um, versus uh, when it kind of falls on, from the point of view of the classical receptive field, the exact same stimulus. Um, but here, uh, this edge is, you know, part of the, the right-hand side of a, um, another object. Um, but, um, but then the kind of idea here is that uh, rather than kind of Border ownership being just a limited phenomenon, uh, these kind of um, kind of hierarchical binding representations uh, exist at kind of multiple levels of the uh, hierarchy. So you know whether it's contours um, and how we represent those, or you know a feature like an eye. Um, you know depending on how you parse this, you either understand that this eye is part of this kind of profile of a face, or you may parse this as a as a single giant face, in which case um, the kind of what that eye is, is part of uh, changes. Is this a real statue? Uh, this I, think it is. I think it's a photo. Okay. It's, it's, it's from a, a Pink Floyd album. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's the, that's the, the main idea. Um, and then, so I was next going to talk about how this might be implemented in kind of an image computable network or specifically a deep learning network. Um, so I don't know saying, if there are any other questions at this point. Is it, are you saying this is your half hour point or is this? Uh, oh, no. Uh, oh. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, how long have I been going? Uh, so, no, no. I, I'm just curious. Okay. You want to continue going? Yeah, that's all right. I think uh, I've got maybe another five, 10 minutes. No, it's all right. Yeah, so you, just, yeah you, could, you could take, uh, I think, yeah, I think if you had prepared for half an hour, I think it's reasonable to assume 45 to 60 minutes for the actual thing. With, with, discussion with discussions. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's okay. Fine. Great. So, um, so yeah, no, I'm just going back to this uh, toy example again of uh, vertical bars driving um, some sort of kind of invariant representation. Um, now the kind of idea is how can this yeah be encoded in a uh, deep learning system? And so in the kind of what I was discussing before, there was kind of this high importance put on things like spiking and conduction delays and, and that sort of thing. But kind of from an algorithmic point of view, ultimately what this binding representation doing, is doing is encoding a causal uh, relation between this low level feature and this high level feature. And, and saying that it was this uh, representation that was responsible for its activity and not uh, this, this one. Um, and so to, to kind of do this in a, in a CNN, um, I thought I'd just briefly kind of uh, go over again just the convolutional neural networks. Um, so yeah, you kind of have the lower level representation, whether that's pixel space or a, a particular layer, and then the convolution, 
is a, a kind of linear sum being applied, say, in a two by two area, and then shifted over uh, in these different quadrants. And then if there's kind of a match between essentially what's a feature detector or kind of template uh, matching system, then you get a high activity and that's kind of considered presence of a feature. And then max pooling uh, is a way of baking in kind of invariance and in particular uh, tolerance to translation uh, of features um, because kind of regardless of where let's say this eight level of activity is, uh, the max pooled representation will uh, stay the same. Um, and so if you kind of look at say a Lynette 5 type architecture where there's uh, two convolutions, two max pooling, you know, you might imagine that, okay, so this in the max pool layer, this it's kind of uh, encoding contour A is somewhere in the top half of the image, uh, whereas in the layer below, as well as other representations, it has this kind of contour A is at position X. So some more spatial specificity. So to, to capture which neuron in this layer was causally you know, responsible for the max pooled representation uh, is very straightforward in the case of max pooling. Uh, and it's actually an operation that already exists, uh, which is known as unpooling. Um, and unpooling is normally used in the decoder part of a, an autoencoder uh, to enable reconstruction. But here it's being used in the feed forward part of the network. And so the idea is, um, if you kind of think back to these representations, this T is uh, a more invariant uh, kind of T neuron, say, uh, whereas this one uh, has a smaller receptive field. Um, and because of that smaller receptive field, and because of the higher dimension uh, of the space in which it's embedded, it actually encodes uh, spatial information. In, in this case, that the kind of T or whatever it was, uh, was in you know, the top left corner. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll kind of show this later, but then these representations are going to be uh, kind of shown or kind of fed forward uh, jointly. Um, a, a more kind of interesting question then is how to capture uh, which low level features, kind of simpler features, uh, were responsible for driving this more abstract one. So more kind of like the vertical bar that drove the invariant T. Um, and so uh, to do this, I kind of introduced this uh, operation called kind of gradient unpooling, um, which in flavor is very similar um, the idea is that you kind of take the, the gradient of uh, this neuron with respect to the neurons in this layer. Um, and if you do that in this case, uh, you can generate a kind of Boolean mask based on non-zero gradients so that only neurons that were responsible for actually participating in this activity, uh, when you apply that Boolean mask, only their activity will be uh, projected. So this is, it, it naturally results in a sparse representation as, as does incidentally the unpooling. Um, and, uh, and so then the idea is that this is kind of uh, telling the, the next layer that um, these kind of small features with their small receptive fields, it was these that were actually important in this uh, representation. Uh, now I've simplified things in this diagram because here I've shown the max pooling layer as just a single neuron. And so what I've kind of said about the gradient uh, holds, but in reality, the max pooled layer is itself a distributed representation. And so taking what instead uh, I do is take the gradient with respect to the entire max pooled layer. So view it as kind of, yeah, a distributed representation. And then the question is which neurons were most important for driving that distributed representation. But because I'm doing it over the entire max pooled layer, uh, most uh, neurons here will have a non-zero gradient. Uh, so instead, uh, to kind of, again, emphasize this idea of importance, um, I have this hyperparameter uh, gamma, which is essentially the proportion of the largest gradients uh, that I take. Uh, and those largest gradients, their location is then used to generate that same Boolean mask that I mentioned before. Um, and so, uh, yeah, what this kind of uh, ends up doing is, is kind of selecting, okay, which, which of the features were actually critical? And, um, and so the, the kind of value of this uh, gamma in practice is between 0.4 and 0.1. Uh, and it seems to kind of uh, scale such that uh, the more complex the data set, uh, the smaller a gamma one uh, wants to use, at least uh, for adversarial robustness, which uh, I probably won't have time to get into.
Um, but so for example, I use 0.4 for MNIST and 0.1 for CIFAR-10 um, and 0.3 for uh, fashion MNIST incidentally. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, this information is up projected, which I can show, yeah, a bit more kind of maybe uh, clearly here where uh, the kind of the max pooled representations are, are still there. So, um, you know, this still uh, recognizes the importance of these kind of abstract invariant representations, but alongside them, literally just concatenated, are the unpooling and gradient unpooling representations. And so, you know, you might imagine that's something like contour A somewhere in top half, contour A is at position X, uh, and contour A is made by edges B and uh, edges C. Uh, and then all of that is fed uh, into a, a dense layer. Uh, and then, so I guess the, the kind of real important thing then is kind of, you know, what possible relation does this have to, um, I recognize uh, this know, image, <laughs> <laughs> right, to, to cortical grid cells, um, and displacement cells. And, uh, you know, I, I'm still getting to grips with the, the kind of cortical, uh, grid and displacement cells. So I, I may be mistaken, but at least my kind of intuition at the moment is that, uh, the kind of, the real advantage of this, um, this kind of representation is the flexibility in terms of uh, kind of querying these these spatial representations and and you know everything you can do with that in terms of both um, kind of transitioning between different um, frames of reference and say kind of predicting okay at some holdout uh, location what feature do I expect there and so on and so forth. Um, the the kind of what uh, what I've kind of shown here the the kind of nice thing about that is you can actually yeah, take a, uh, uh, an image, uh, a kind of high dimensional input and rapidly and in parallel uh, extract uh, both kind of features, but also some degree of uh, kind of spatial information about those features. Um, and that I think that, you know, that could be the kind of representation that could then be fed into uh, these kind of cortical grid cells um, as kind of an initial uh, kind of location-based representation um, to kind of then then enable further processing. A quick question um, on the previous slide. There. Um, yeah. So if you were to shift everything by one pixel, uh, the max pool representation is going to be s somewhat invariant to it because you're doing the max pooling. Yeah. Um, but the other two wouldn't be invariant. Is that right? It's, well, it's kind of a it's it's a it's a continuum of invariance as you kind of. So, so if you were shift by one pixel, this one probably wouldn't change uh, either. Um, this one, you know, maybe one of the features changes and the other one doesn't. Um, so it depends on how much you were to shift it. Mm -hmm. uh, because ultimately this, this layer was also preceded by a, a max pooling and, and so forth. So, so it, yeah, it really depends on the receptive field of these, um, these neurons. Wouldn't both of them just shift completely? Um, uh, so wouldn't unpooling also shift if you shift it, the uh, pixels below by, I'm trying to, I, I, I don't have an intuition course. for the unpooling. But. So, so I guess, I guess the idea then with the unpooling is, um, yeah, cause that, that comp would be, it'd be the, if you shift everything to the right by one pixel, the comp oh, yeah. layer so, would shift. So yeah. in, in this case, if this was the, the input, that, that is the case, sorry. But, but the assumption here is this is um, this is this layer, um, which has uh, oh, okay. happened after a max pooling. Oh, oh, oh so, I see. So I at, see. At, okay. at the pixel yeah, level, yeah. these these neurons are tolerant to a certain amount of shift, and uh, so I've also kind of done this in a VGG network where okay. Okay. these representations are even higher up in the hierarchy, and then you know arguably. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you're not in, doing in, this at you're not doing this at every level of the hierarchy. You're just doing no, it at the very no, top. No, and, and I mean that's also kind of a, a hyperparameter or or kind of yeah architectural oh, okay, okay. decision to make is kind of how many of these are you going to include? Um, yeah. In practice, I found uh, just one unpooling and one gradient unpooling is sufficient for MNIST, uh, uh, whereas I use two of each for uh, BGG on CIFAR ten. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And, and that was a, um, I think a 15 deep layer. I can't actually remember now. Yeah. Um, no network. Um, yeah, but um, 
because I mean, I, I think Supertie, you mentioned uh, that Marcus, maybe you were uh, looking at uh, applying uh, capsule networks to extract some kind of spatial information uh, for kind of feeding into the kind of cortical grid cells. Um, but I'm wondering if, if this could be kind of, yeah, I mean, as I've mentioned, kind of these ideas in my view are complementary to what capsule networks are doing, but then the advantage is they are very fast and, and easy to train. Um, um, so I, I, I would, I didn't mean to imply Marcus was doing that specific thing that you mentioned. I think he's just oh, generally okay. looking at, just, I, I, at least thinking about it. and location representations. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, but I guess, yeah. And I think this is too ambitious for a, a rotation project, but I mean, one thing that I think is interesting is that, you know, this kind of ends up uh, creating, yeah, these, these different layers of abstraction of kind of, um, uh, features with kind of an object uh, like reference frame. Um, and so, you know, what can you then do with displacement cells in terms of kind of, if you have information at what lay, uh, one layer, you know, what can you query about uh, representations at another and, and that kind of thing. Um, but those are just some ideas I've had. Excuse me, I'm, I'm still, um, I'm still reading, kind of rereading this paper. Um, and uh, yeah, making sure I kind of understand everything. Yeah, just, to, just to jump in, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna yeah. sit with what you've presented and think about it some. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a useful thing to <laughs> put on our radar. Okay, cool. Anyone wants uh, kind of a write-up that goes through this, uh, you know, to have in front of you, I can send around the, um, the iClear paper, which kind of, in yeah, introduces this architecture and then uh, talks about its relevance to uh, adversarial examples. Um, but I think I'll, I'll stop there. Um, but, but I guess, cool. you know, Thanks. just, just, yeah. just as a teaser to hopefully get people interested, <laughs> uh, it does, it does make a big difference. It does seem to, to result in, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't particularly like the kind of the way state of the art is measured in, in a lot of machine learning papers, so I'm hesitant to make that claim, but uh, but it certainly leads to robustness across a, a huge number of um, different adversarial attacks. I was trying to think through in my head how this relates to you know what we do is we, we do K winner take all on the yeah on the feature outputs um, in a CNN layer, and and you know and then do the uh, the other stuff. So I was just trying to think through. It's it's but, it's know, uh, quite similar. This. Yeah, it's quite similar, it's and similar. actually, in in my, it's not it's it's similar, but it's not. Um, yeah. So, well, so, so it's just, yeah, the, it's it's similar in that yeah you end up with sparsity and um and that I guess you know the K winner if it's just based on the activity in this layer is still capturing some idea of kind of uh, importance, um and actually at, at kind of one point what I originally wanted to do was rather than just using the gradients, was to multiply these kind of gradient values that extracted by the activity and then apply this kind of gamma um, kind of uh, operation to say, okay, which of these were the most important? Um, but that's actually, TensorFlow doesn't like that because it, of this <laughs> kind of particular gradient operation that's not implemented. Uh, I was able to do it in PyTorch, but in practice, I didn't see a huge difference uh, in terms of the the kind of adversarial robustness, uh, so I decided just to to kind of leave that. But um, yeah, and I should say the kind of as a last thing, not not really related to the K winner, but there are definitely better ways of measuring how important a level and driving a higher level representation. So like there's this um, a lot of work that's been done in kind of explainable AI, uh, and there's one kind of particular um, measure called conductance, which is a way of kind of numerically estimating the importance of this neuron in the, for a higher level neuron, um, which, which is definitely superior to what I've done here, but it just takes, uh, it's just computationally impossible to just implement that in the forward pass of a network, whereas this is, this is quite efficient and so it can actually be done in practice. Um, And so, and so, yeah, so that's, again, maybe one of the, the reasons to plug for the kind of biological implementation of this is that, you know, that does it kind of uh, in parallel using local information uh, very rapidly, whereas, you know, here I've had to implement a non-local algorithm to kind of artificially try and capture 
this uh, causal re uh, relationship. Mm -hmm.